Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to today's Vanandal Institute's public lecture on feeling the immune system. My name is Brett Holloman. I'm the Chief Philanthropy Officer for Vanandal Institute, and I am so glad many of you have signed on for today's event. And I'm hoping that we will soon be able to offer an in-person option for attending these, as well as the continuation of joining us virtually. Uh, we will be taping today's episode and sending that out at a later time. So if there are issues with technology or anything like that, uh, we will be sending you to a tape link at a later date. Today, we have Dr. Rusty Jones and Dr. Connie Kryshek who are joining us to shine some light on the critical relationship between metabolism and immunity. They'll tackle questions like, how does the immune system recognize and fight off infection? Where does the immune system get the energy needed to function? And what role does diet play in bolstering the body's natural defenses? And if you find yourself with your own questions during the presentations, please feel free to submit them via the chat function or hold on to them and submit them when we begin the Q&A, but we'll have a live Q&A session at the very end. Now I'd like to introduce our experts, Dr. Connie Kryshek, is an associate professor at BAI and a leader in investigating the links between metabolism, epigenetics, and the immune system, with the ultimate goal of understanding how the three work together to keep us healthy, and when things go wrong, to ward off disease. Connie earned her Bachelor of Science with honors in molecular biology and genetics from University of Guelph, followed by her PhD in cell and molecular biology from the University of Toronto. In 2011, Dr. Kryshek was recruited to McGill University as an assistant professor, where her work focused on the molecular mechanisms regulating immune function and the immune system's role in cancer development. She then joined BAI in 2018 as an associate professor as part of our new metabolic and nutritional programming group. Uh, immediately following her will be Dr. Rusty Jones. Rusty is also a leading expert in the study of cancer metabolism and immunology. Rusty is a professor and chair of the Metabolic and Nutritional Programming Group at VAI and investigates metabolism at the cellular level to understand how it affects cell behavior and health with a specific eye on cancer and the immune system. By revealing how cancer cells use metabolic processes to fuel their growth, growth and spread, Dr. Jones hopes to develop new treatments that help patients by changing the standard of care for cancer. Dr. Jones earned his Bachelor of Science with honors in biochemistry and his PhD in medical biophysics from the University of Toronto. After completing a postdoctoral fellowship at Thompson at University of Pennsylvania in 2008, he accepted a position as an assistant professor in the Department of Physiology and Goodman Cancer Research Center at McGill University. Dr. Jones joined VAI's Center for Cancer and Cell Biology in 2018 and as program lead and also as a founding member of the Van Andel Institute Metabolic Nutritional Programming Group. Please join me today in offering a very warm welcome to Dr. Kryshek and Dr. Jones. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this um, discussion about the immune system. So my role here in the beginning will be to give an overall or a general introduction to immune cells and what they do for our body and how they protect us from disease and sometimes cause disease. I will be followed by my colleague, Dr. Jones, and he will get more into the specifics about how immune cells are fueled and um, what uh, nutrition optimizes their responses. So as Brett mentioned, I'm an immunologist and I've been spending most of my career studying um, immunology. But um, when we think of the immune system, most of us think of just the cells inside our body that circulate and protect us from infection. But the thing is, your immune system is much more than that. Your immune system is really a surveillance system that um, navigates through your entire body. And in fact, 
your immune system comprises more than just the immune cells that um, circulate your body and search for infections or cancer. It also is comprised of what we call barrier surfaces, such as your skin or your mucous membranes that um, line your esophagus and your stomach and your gastrointestinal tract. Anything that interacts with the outside environment also has immune activity. Now, your immune system can actually be thought of as a sense in a way. It's there to sense any kind of invader, anything that's wrong, such as a tumor growing, or any kind of uh, danger or injury, or danger such as an injury, or um, it actually detects also inflammation. And so the immune system is made up of several different parts. It, 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 it spreads or, or is part of your entire body. And um, what it can do is it can learn about pathogens and remember them and protect you in the future against pathogen exposure. And this is a concept that is most well understood in the context of vaccination. So your immune system is comprised of many different cell types. And on the left here, we see um, a bunch of blue cells. And those cells are part of what we call the innate immune system. And on the right are cells called the adaptive immune system or adaptive immune cells, and they're part of the adaptive immune system. And I wanna get in a little bit about the difference of the functions among these cells. So if you can think of the blue cells as your more generalized response and your green cells as your more specific response. If anybody can think back to what Brett was wearing this morning, um, I hope you were paying keen attention. Brett was wearing a blue jacket and a blue shirt. And so the adaptive immune or the, the innate immune system, the blue cells are the cells that say, hey, hey, I recognize a blue shirt. I recognize a blue shirt. And so for example, if we had to hunt down and find all Van Andel Institute employees, and let's say we were required to wear a uniform, those cells, would be able to identify us based on wearing the color blue, for example. And so um, they're sort of more generalized. So they might be able to say, this is a virus, or this is a bacterium, or this is some self tissue. And I really don't know if it's a tumor or something, it's just something's wrong with it. And they mount a more generalized rapid response. Then the cells, such as the green cells are looking for something more specific. So Brett was wearing a Van Andel angel pin. And so those cells say, okay, Brett's wearing a blue shirt and he has a Van Andel pin. And that's where they're specifically recognizing something. So they don't go after say the Microsoft employee who's on the street and also wearing a blue shirt or an employee from another company who's also wearing a blue shirt and not wearing the Van Andel pin. And the really neat thing about these cells is they could recognize um, a pin such that Brett wore right on his lapel or mine hidden here out of sight. Um, they can recognize these differences. And so this is what allows our immune system to say, hey, there's an invader. I think it's, for example, a virus. And, it, and then the green cells say it's specifically SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. So what happens when we, um, when we mount an immune response? So I've used an example here of, let's say a vaccination. So you get a vaccination in your arm and there's these cells that rest in all of your tissues called dendritic cells. And this is a, a group of cells my lab works on. And the dendritic cells, I will recognize, they're the blue cells, they'll recognize, say, hey, this is a virus. But in order to communicate to the green cells, they have to migrate to the lymph nodes. So they have to move from the site of infection or site of vaccination to another place, a specialized place to meet with these, with these green cells. And the lymph node, if you recall, maybe the last time you were sick, you had a sore throat, your lymph node got swollen here, or maybe after your vaccination, you got a swollen lymph node under your armpit, or maybe you recognize the name lymph because you've had a lymphatic massage. And the lymph node is a specialized um, 
meeting room or a specialized um, uh, situation room where all these cells come in and they start communicating about what they have found. So the dendritic cells will come in and say, I think it has something to do with these guys in the blue shirt. Here's all the information and they'll dump all the information. And then the T cells and the B cells will say, hey, it's those ones with the Van Andel Institute um, angel on them. Those are the ones we have to go after. And so this, the lymphatics are like immune superhighways where the immune cells can be in the blood, but they don't have to go through the blood in order to have this interaction. And so this is a very fast way to allow these cells to meet together and mount an immune response. But immunity is always a balance. And so in um, the resting state, these dendritic cells um, will not activate the T cells. And this is what we call tolerance. So think of it as your body is tolerating something. We're tolerating ourselves, which is great, right? We don't want our immune system activating ourselves. But you can get, also get tolerance to microbes that are good for you or other things in your environment. And this is a really important aspect of immunity, but we have to balance also with a mounting an immune response. So these immune cells really have to be very carefully and finely tuned to mount responses versus stay quiet when they don't need to mount responses. And sometimes when they mount responses to self, we get something called autoimmunity, where the immune system is suddenly, suddenly recognizing part of ourselves as that Van Andel angel um, that, you know, we don't want targeted. And so we're, uh, my lab is very interested in studying this balance. And then if we go, for example, to COVID-19, if you're wondering what cells are actually um, responding to COVID-19, most of your cells are. Most of your cells, most of the studies have uh, shown so far that all of your entire immune system is engaged in fighting SARS-CoV-2. And the cells that are most effective at eliminating infected cells are cells called NK cells or natural killer cells. And they are part of your innate immune response and cells such as your CD8 T cells that are part of your adaptive cell, uh, adaptive immune response. And these cell types recognize specifically infected cells or in another context, cancer cells and kill the infected cell. On the other hand, we've heard a lot about um, antibodies and it's your B cells that make the antibodies. So your B cells are activated in a similar way and will generate antibodies that are specific for that uh, Van Andel Institute ID that will go out and target uh, circulating virions or circulating virus and, and clear those viruses. So what is inflammation? I've talked about something very specific to specific pathogens and specifically clearing um, threats in the body. But sometimes we get inflammation. And I, and I, I would guess a lot of you have experienced inflammation, either um, some soreness after some work or some uh, an injury or maybe um, a bump or a bruise that cause inflammation or some chronic wear inflammation or inflammation associated with another disease. And so inflammation is natural. It's a normal part of our body's response. Our immune cells are going in to survey what's going on, what they can do to help tissue repair. Is there any kind of bacteria that needs to be cleared? Um, if um, the cells can promote tissue, uh, tissue homeostasis or tissue function. And then when that in inflammation resolves, all of that is drained out of your lymphatics. It's all drained down um, through your lymphatics and, and drained out of the body. And so what can go wrong is if the body seems to think there is a still a danger. So you get this chronic inflammation that maybe you had an injury and it hasn't healed, or maybe just for some reason, your immune system is a bit overstimulated and thinks it needs to keep going in and check out that something's going wrong. And um, when this happens, you can get chronic inflammation or inflammation causing disease. So how does being male or female impact disease risk? So there's this fascinating phenomenon in immunology that we find that women in general mount stronger immune responses than men. 
And so naturally women are more protected against viruses and cancer, whereas men are more susceptible to viruses and cancer. But the downside of that heightened immune response is that women are more susceptible to autoimmune disease. And so we see this, what we call sexual dimorphism in immune responses, which is something my lab finds incredibly fascinating. We've even seen this in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, as we've seen men have been more susceptible to adverse outcomes of infection than women. And so we think it's super important to really start to understand the mechanisms of why there's the sex difference in immune responses. And so one aspect of sex differences, of course, is hormones. So um, females have more estrogen and males have more androgens. And estrogens have been generally shown to stimulate inflammatory responses, whereas androgens have been generally shown to suppress uh, um, immune responses. But uh, hormones don't explain everything. And actually, we even see sex dif differences um, prior to the onset of puberty and after menopause and andropause, suggesting that um, there are uh, differences other than hormones that are affecting sex differences in immunity. And one of those um, sources of differences are our chromosomes. So there are, um, there are, humans have two different sex chromosomes, the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. Females have two Xs and males have an X and a Y. And these chromosomes determine biological sex. But what we found is that the X chromosome actually contains a lot of immune-related genes. And my lab studies a gene called KDM5C. It regulates programming of immune cells. And on females, they have two copies of KDM5C. So they have one copy on each X chromosome. Males only have one X chromosome, so they only have one copy of KDM5C. And on the Y chromosome, they have a, a related protein called KDM5D. And what we're studying in my lab is to understand how these proteins are different and how they drive sex-specific immune responses. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope um, um, you enjoyed this lecture and learned a little bit more about the immune system. I ha I'm happy to pass it off to my colleague, Dr. Jones, who will get into more details about metabolism. Well, thank you, Dr. Krawczyk, and um, thank you for the introduction. And I'm very happy to be here with all of you virtually today um, for this discussion of the immune system and, and metabolism. Um, I'd like to sort of take over the reins from Dr. Krawczyk and, and introduce a different avenue um, related to our immune system, and that's really how metabolism um, in our body helps to modulate how our immune system uh, functions. So the first thing I'd like to, um, oh, excuse me, first thing I want to uh, sort of illustrate and what many of you in the audience are probably th uh, thinking about right now is what exactly is metabolism? It's a word that's thrown around quite a bit. Often when we talk about metabolism, we think about our diet, we think about our weight, but really weight and diet are, are, are linked to metabolism, but isn't really what metabolism is all about. And what metabolism really is, is the, the biological process by which our bodies convert the food that we eat into energy and building blocks that cells in our body can use. So if we look at this diagram here on the right, it's really how we convert food, um, which is basically food is essentially chemical energy that's trapped in food form. And then our body extracts that energy um, by breaking down this food into macronutrients in our body that are absorbed by the body and then converted to a very important molecule that is the is the energy molecule of our body, which is um, a molecule known as adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Now, ATP is incredibly important because it powers all biological processes in our body from physical activity, so muscle contraction when we're, we're working out or walking down the street. It helps to uh, fuel the cells in our brain to allow us to think. And as well, very simple fact of just keeping our bodies warm. ATP is used to, he to heat our body. And so the process of metabolism is really the, the basic pro process in which 
chemical energy from the form of food can be broken down and used into a different form of chemical energy that is ATP in our, in our bodies. And so when we think about metabolism, uh, this can be thought about in two general areas. One is the concept of what we call whole body metabolism. And then on a cellular level, it's cellular metabolism. So when we think about whole body metabolism, this is really the process in which food is converted into nutrients and then absorbed and used by cells of the body. And so the process in which uh, food is broken down into macronutrients and, and then processed, this is a highly regulated process. It depends on the inputs, the food that we put into our bodies, but as well, it's highly regulated by hormones, which are molecules, essentially signaling molecules or messages that are sent out from different organs in our body that help to tell these organs what process they have to do in breaking down in breaking down these nutrients. A great example of a hormone that plays a really important role in regulating metabolism is insulin. You may know of insulin, it's a, it's a hormone that's actually secreted by the pancreas, which is one of the major organs of metabolism. And insulin is really important, delivers a signal to cells in our body on how to use sugar. And of course, problems with insulin and, and insulin sensitivity is one of the major reasons um, for type two diabetes. Now, the job of whole body metabolism, as I mentioned, is to take food, to break it down into nutrients that then can be used by cells. And so cellular metabolism is the process by which cells of the body can take these nutrients and use it to, to generate this energy molecule known as ATP. You might recognize the cells on this slide. On the left is a dendritic cell and on the right is a T cell, which is an immune cell that I'm gonna talk about um, in the next couple of slides. And so dendritic cells and T cells, one of their major functions in order to do their job is to regulate metabolism so that they can make the energy that they need. And so right at the nexus of all of the, these two points of whole body metabolism and cellular metabolism is your diet. It's how does the food that we input into our body help to fuel whole body metabolism and give cells the things that they need to run their programs. And in the case of the immune system, protect our body from infection and cancer. And what I'm gonna go over in the next um, uh, few minutes is some of the ideas around diet and how diet can be uh, used to modulate immune responses. So one of the major uh, things in the body, in cells of our body that helps us to convert nutrients into energy is an organelle uh, called a mitochondria. So what you can see here are these sort of graphical depiction in green are these um, bean-like structures in our, that exist in every cell uh, of, of our body. And the important thing about mitochondria is that they're a very specialized structure in our cells. They're exquisitely able to um, extract energy from nutrients. What's very interesting is that mitochondria is uh, exist in all cells of mammals and will be used to break down nutrients into energy. In plants, a similar organelle called a chloroplast actually does the reverse. It actually takes energy from the sun and uses that to convert sunlight into nutrients such as, such as sugar. So the important thing about mitochondria is that they are really important for um, generating ATP, but they also have house a series of biochemical reactions that really power different things that the cell needs. So the, the mitochondria will produce building blocks for cell growth. So if a cell needs to build proteins or the cell needs to build fatty acids uh, for cellular structures, this is all coordinated by the mitochondria. And what's really interesting as well is that the mitochondria actually has a very important job to communicate with, with the cell itself to change its function because it really has a, its finger on the pulse of how much energy is in the cell. And so the mitochondria can actually deliver signals out to the cell telling the cell what to do based on the amount of energy that it has. I like to call the mitochondria um, uh, the powerhouse of the cell, but a probably a more apt description is to think that the mitochondria is like the engine in your car, right? And so if we think of nutrients as gas, what the engine does is it converts that gas into usable energy to turn the wheels of your car. And that's exactly what the mitochondria does in, uh, in your cells. And so much like when you have problems with your car engine, 
uh, your car doesn't work as well and can often break down. Problems with mitochondria um, are one of the major underlying forms of disease. Um, as we age, there are differences in the function of mitochondria that, can, that is linked to um, some of the symptoms of, of aging, but also many different diseases at their core have problems with mitochondria is one of the reasons why these diseases develop. And some of the most prominent diseases that are linked to mitochondrial dysfunction are neurological diseases, for example, uh, Parkinson's disease. So these are very important organelles. Every cell in our body uses, uh, uses these, the, the mitochondria in order to make energy. Now, the question is, I've discussed how diet and metabolism are really different things, but the question is, is how are they coordinated? So as I mentioned, food is broken down into macronutrients. So macronutrients are sort of the basic building blocks of, of nutrition. These are carbohydrates, such as sugars, as proteins, as well as fats. And so again, as we eat a meal, we're all familiar, familiar we eat a meal and we swallow. And what this uh, happens after we swallow is this, the food enters into our digestive tract, which is essentially a long tube that has very specific processing steps in order to break down the food and allow that food to be absorbed. We can think of our digestive tract really as um, a, a conveyor belt of a processing plant. Whole food goes in through our mouth, and as it travels down, we have these specialized organs starting with the stomach, which breaks down large uh, solid food into um, a, a more, uh, almost like a mash uh, type of, of uh, foods, uh, solid food, which then transits into the small intestine, which is a really important organ because this is where the nutrients are actually absorbed. Um, after that, the small intestine, uh, the food travels into the large intestine where water is extracted, and ultimately um, uh, the, the remaining waste is, is, uh, is disposed of. I want to point out a really, really important point about our uh, nutritional metabolism that has gotten a lot of attention very recently, but we often don't think about. It's that bacteria in the large intestine, which we also call the microbiome, is a critical point for, how, uh, for our digestive system and how we extract nutrients. So we have a, what we call a symbiotic relationship between our bodies and the bacteria that lives in, a, in our large intestine, in our gut. And why this is such an important relationship is because bacteria in the large intestine can actually break food down further to provide with unique metabolites that our body simply can't make. And so it's really important to note that while we depend on nutrition that we eat, it's also the bacteria in our gut that provide us with some of these special nutrients that allow us to function. For example, uh, different vitamins are processed in uh, the digestive tract because of bacteria. Now, as these nutrients are absorbed uh, in the small intestine, uh, our circulatory system will deliver these nutrients across the body to cells. And cells use specific nutrients to fuel their function. And we're going to talk about immune cells very shortly, but you can think about other cells as really requiring specific nutrients to do their, to do their function. Think of a muscle cell. A muscle cell actually uses sugar and fat in order to, and generates ATP from those nutrients in order to immediate contraction. Um, adipose tissue, which is our fat tissue, um, specifically uses uh, nutritional fats in order to store them for later use. And so we actually have very specialized nutrient use across the body and immune cells are no different. Now, one of the important things to remember uh, is that overnutrition, so eating more calories than we can either use or uh, uh, use at a given time for our basic metabolic rate can lead to adiposity or storage leading to weight gain. And this can lead to other problems such as diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Now, what's very interesting and in sort of at that cutting edge of, of immunology is trying to understand how we can use dietary interventions in order to modulate our, our immune function. And so I'm just sort of wanted to illustrate here just what these dietary interventions actually mean and what they can deliver. The most obvious aspect of dietary uh, intervention is supplementation. I'm sure many of us are familiar with this. Um, especially if you take a daily vitamin, for example. This is supplementing aspects to our diet, giving sort of an uh, injection of a, of a new nutrient uh, to our body in our diet beyond what we get from food. Um, there are other diets which actually can modulate 
the, 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 your metabolism by restricting the types of macronutrients that go into, into our body. And so examples of these types of diets would be a low carbohydrate diet where you're actually restricting the ingestion of a macronutrient, in this case, sugar or, or glucose. Um, other types of macronutrient restriction diets would be the ketogenic diet and where you actually consume a, a large amount of fat to put your body into a nutritional state called ketosis, where your body is burning fat preferentially as a fuel over carbohydrates. Um, there are also elimination diets in which um, specific foods are removed from, from the diet. And this is often used in the case where someone has a food sensitivity or a food allergy, which is causing as Connie uh, mentioned in her talk, some foods can actually cause inflammation in the GI tract, which can affect your body. And so one of the ways that we can affect this is by simply eliminating the triggers for this inflammation by removing these aspects from the diet. And one of the really interesting areas, uh, uh, um, both for control of weight gain and, and metabolic conditions like diabetes, uh, but also for our immune function, is some of the aspects of controlling overall nutrition or calorie intake. And that's sort of controlled by uh, other methods such as fasting. So this fasting is a process in which you go without food for a defined period of time. Typically this would be 24 to 72 hours or one to th three days of having no food intake except for water. Um, and probably more, um, uh, uh, relevant, particularly within um, the, the uh, field of weight control, is a process of, uh, of well, almost like a fasting-like process, which is called time-restricted feeding. You may be familiar with this if you've read anything about the intermittent fasting type of diet that's out there. This is a case where you restrict your food intake during specific times of the day. So for example, someone who's on a 16-8 a uh, intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding diet would only eat for eight hours in a day. So for example, you would have your first meal at 12 noon and you would eat a normal uh, lunch and snacks and dinner, but then not eat anything after 8 p.m. And then you basically are fasting for 16 hours until 12 noon the next day. And so they've been shown to have some benefits uh, both fasting and time-restricted feeding have been shown to have some significant benefits on immune cell function, particularly on the ability of our bodies to not only fight infection, but also have what we call a memory response, the ability to respond to pathogens when we encounter them again, which I think is very important when we think about things like vaccination and, and recurrent infectious diseases like COVID. Now, where does the immune system come into all this? Well, I think what's important to note is that the immune system really is at the center of this metabolic network. So if we think about immune cells in the center here, this is an example of a B cell. These are the antibody producing cells that Connie mentioned in her uh, discussion. Immune cells are both responsive to changes in metabolism, but also can elicit changes in metabolism. And so I really want to sort of introduce this idea that the immune system is really right in the middle of uh, being affected by aspects of, of metabolism. Um, and so there's a lot of interplay between these nodes of metabolism and immune cell function. Let's start with the diet. So one thing that I've mentioned is that obviously our diet can actually deliver um, nutrients uh, to our body. And so what we both our lab and other labs around the world have been able to show that um, you can modulate, specifically modulate the function of immune cells uh, by changing aspects in your diet. I'm gonna give uh, an example of this very shortly, but just to say that you can actually, by understanding what are the dietary requirements of immune cells, we can either give more of these uh, nutrients or take away these nutrients from our diet and can have local effects on immune cell function. As I mentioned, the microbiome or the microbiota, the bacteria that live in our gut are really, really important for helping our immune system function properly. And one of the ways that the microbiome actually does this is by providing nutrients that help our immune cells function. One of the major uh, metabolites that bacteria in our gut actually make is a, is a uh, molecule known as acetate. You are probably all familiar with acetate by its trade name, which is vinegar. So bacteria in our gut can actually make uh, essentially can make vinegar from the food that we eat. And it's this acetate 
that immune cells like T cells of the immune system actually use in order to um, do their job. So it's very important from the perspective of your of metabolism that the microbiome can actually provide fuels to your immune cells to help them function better. And then finally, we have this concept of whole body metabolism. Again, if our body is regulating the types of nutrients we have, we believe that there's a very strong regulation uh, from your body providing your immune cells with the nutrients they need at just the right time. And as well, immune cells can actually function to shape how our body uses nutrients. There's a lot of really interesting science out there that suggests that there are immune cells that are actually in our metabolic organs. For example, immune cells that actually live in the, our fat tissue to help regulate how fat is absorbed and um, how it's used by the body. Now, one thing, question that many of you are probably wondering is how does metabolism affect your immune system? I wanna just think about it from simply uh, the perspective of uh, uh, that the cells need energy to function. And so one of the uh, best examples of this are T cells. Uh, Kwani uh, introduced this in her, in, her, uh, in her lecture, really telling about the different cells of the immune system that are required to fight off an infection such as um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. And one of the ways that T cells fight off virus infected cells is once this T cell recognizes um, the Van Andel pin, for example, here on my shirt, um, this T cell has to then expand uh, to become an army of T cells. So what's an amazing aspect of the immune system is that we have these circulating immune cells and T cells and B cells of the immune system, once they recognize a target, have this amazing ability to proliferate. And this simply means that one cell divides into two cells, two cells divide into four cells and so on until you eventually get, give rise to a complete army of T cells or B cells that can fight off the infection. And so if you can imagine going from a resting T cell to an activated T cell, and then ultimately to an army of T cells, you need a lot of energy and you would need a lot of building blocks. And what's amazing is that immune cells, um, when they become activated, uh, one of their important functions is to generate energy and raw materials to do their jobs. And so your metabolic system and your diet actually combine to supply immune cells with the nutrients that they need to function. So for example, some of the major things that our, our cells need is to produce proteins um, and fats. So for, for um, the biomass, we call biomass for the cell to, uh, to grow and proliferate. And again, we, the T cells, if they're dividing, actually need to duplicate their DNA. So they actually have to make DNA molecules that in order to divide. And so T cells regulate their metabolism to actually make these things that they need. And the mitochondria is at the center of this. It really is important in generating this energy and the, the building blocks to, um, to grow and proliferate. And so what's amazing is that during this whole process, um, if immune cells like T cells need things to grow and proliferate, we can actually modulate this um, by our diet. And I wanna to end today with one example of this. Um, Connie had mentioned uh, about autoimmune disease. And again, autoimmune diseases are conditions in which our own immune system essentially attack our own body uh, because they think that there's a, there's a problem that um, parts of our body are, are foreign. And so one prominent uh, autoimmune disease um, is multiple sclerosis. And what multiple sclerosis is, is essentially a condition where our immune cells attack the nerves of our body. Um, so these would be T cells and other, another, uh, other immune cells which actually attack the nerves of our body. And this can cause fatigue, motor symptoms, other aspects um, leading to, to the condition. And very, um, what's very interesting about multiple sclerosis is it's an example of an autoimmune disease that actually has a defined sex difference. So as Connie had mentioned that um, autoimmune diseases tend to be more prevalent in females. And you can actually see this in the, the data that I'm showing on the right. So if you just look here, the graph is showing, the green line is showing the prevalence of disease in females or males over time. And you can see very clearly that the onset of multiple sclerosis in this experiment is actually larger in females than males. But one of the interesting things that we know is that T cells that are causing this disease 
really need to make proteins in order to function. I sort of highlighted that on the last slide. So one of the critical proteins that are uh, 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 parts of those proteins is an amino acid known as methionine. So by understanding the needs, in this case of our own autoimmune T cells, we could actually enter into a dietary intervention. And in this case, what we've done is we've just simply removed this amino acid methionine from the diet. And as you can see in the graphs, in the, with, the, with the orange bars, you can simply by putting, um, in this case, experimental animals on a diet that has very low methionine, this can reduce the, the severity, the number of, of animals in this case that actually get disease. So again, it's an example of how we can use diet to um, influence our immune cell function. We've shown in this case, we can use diet to modulate um, autoreactive cells in this case that can cause disease. And there's a lot of really interesting data coming out in the field of, of cancer that using other dietary interventions such as fasting can actually enhance the function of immune cells uh, in being able to fight off things like cancer. So thank you very much for listening. I'm more than happy to take questions um, in the next session about this work. I'll unmute myself and then thank you once again for uh, the information that you've shared. Uh, it uh, makes me pause to think that both the complexity of the human body, uh, but even more than that, uh, the complexity of disease and our ability to understand it and the opportunity for us to potentially influence it. Uh, Connie, um, which of the innate and adaptive immunity cells are considered either red blood cells or white blood cells? Is there a connect, is it connected or how, how does that play together? Yes, so they're white blood cells. So your red blood cells are responsible for carrying oxygen to your tissues. And um, Rusty didn't go into it, or Dr. Jones didn't go into it, but that's important um, for oxidative metabolism. But all of, yes, all of the white blood cells or your white blood cell, cell count, those are all your innate and adaptive immune cells. Gotcha, thank you. So um, around anti-inflammatories, you had mentioned, uh, Connie, that um, women and men uh, react potentially differently to disease and autoimmunity and some of that sort of thing with the role of estrogen and androgens uh, on inflammation. Suspicions on how anti-inflammatories work? Is there a different response in anti-inflammatory medication for, between men and women? That's a really good question. I don't know of a clinical trial now. Uh, of course, um, I haven't read all of the clinical trials myself, but I don't know of a clinical trial actually addressing that question. And so this would have to be addressed in, in the form of um, a, a trial with controls and, and patients carefully selected. Um, Anti-inflammatories generally, so if we're, we're thinking about all the immune cells rushing in, they generally, in general, suppress the entire immune system. So suppress all of that coming in. And the problem with most anti-inflammatories, they work, of course, we feel better, we, they reduce our symptoms, but they don't address the cause of the inflammation. And so sometimes just taking all the cells out allows the body to resolve the inflammation on its own. And that's when you'll see success with a general anti-inflammatory. But when inflammatories don't work, they just reduce pain or reduce the severity. Um, it's because they don't get at the reason the immune cells keep thinking they need to go in. Um, whether females or males respond better, I actually don't know the answer to that. Great question. Great. Um, we hear a lot about probiotics, prebiotics. You both have spoken about, about the microbiome and metabolism. Um, Rusty, talk to us a little bit about what role potentially probiotics and prebiotics play in terms of maybe disease modification or disease prevention, or do we know what role they could play? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Brett. Um, so I think a lot of the research that has come out of the, of the last several years suggests that there are, that changes in your microbiome can actually um, not just be a passenger for disease, but also end up driving disease. So often what can happen is that, um, you know, a disease state can be um, 
can promote a change in your microbiome. And so you can have different species of bacteria, which can essentially um, take up a bigger part of your gut, if, you, if that's an easy way to think about it, and um, can basically skew how your immune system is responding. And in some cases, uh, such as in, uh, in cancer, it's been shown that there is a very different type of microbiome associated with people who have cancer than those who don't. And, as a con and this is likely due to as the immune system is responding against cancer, it's just changing the microbiome and then this feeds back to the immune system and then that changes the microbiome. And it basically, you get a snapshot where um, the, the, the microbiome is not supportive of the immune system, but can be basically a hindrance. And I think where the research is suggesting is that by understanding what is the microbiome that is a good microbiome, you can use things like probiotics, um, or what we call fecal transfers, where you're basically changing the microbiome from uh, by uh, transferring in bacteria directly into the gut can actually have an effect on moving it back to a good microbiome. And I think this is a really interesting part of research because we, we may know a lot about what are good bacteria, but we don't know what the good bacteria do in order to help to shape the immune system in a good way. And that's, that's a really important thing to figure out. Connie, anything to add from your perspective? No, that's a really um, thorough answer. And um, only to add that um, there's a lot of research, current research right now, really focused on the interaction between the microbiota and the immune system because they're, they're microbes, right? And so our immune system, this goes back to the balance I was speaking about. You know, your immune system is meant to detect microbes but they're also meant to tolerate and, and work together with the microbes in your gut. And so on these barrier surfaces where there's interaction with the outside world and more interaction with um, microbes in general, the immune system has to very delicate, delicately balance if they're going to respond or not. And so I think it's, it's just a fascinating aspect of our immune system. You, you've spoke, Rusty, a little bit about um, one of the questions that came in in terms of fecal transplants to restore a healthy microbiome. Uh, what diseases are they finding success with in modifications of the microbiome through a fecal transplant? Um, what kind of research has been done in that space and what still maybe needs to be learned or discovered? Yeah, and the obvious thing that jumps out is uh, inflammatory bowel disease conditions, right? So Crohn's disease, uh, colitis, um, which are often, again, this is an example that you have inflammation in the gut and then this begins to change the, the types of microbes that are in the gut that can basically reinforce the disease state. And the idea of the fecal transfer is you come in and you, you basically reset your microbiome into a more healthy microbiome that sort of reduces that inflammation. And so... IBD is one, one great example where, where this, this happens. I think the more experimental areas, you know, what we're finding is that uh, in other conditions where the immune system plays a role, such as in fighting cancer, um, there is evidence that you can have uh, change out the microbiome um, in patients that have different um, cancers, and it allows the immune system to fight these cancers better. And what's fascinating about this for example, some of the research that's been published on this where fecal transfers can actually enhance cancer Im immunotherapy or the immune system's ability to fight cancer have been in conditions like melanoma. And so I want to so highlight this. Melanoma is a cancer essentially of the skin, mm -hmm. right? So it's very fascinating to think that the types of bacteria that are living in your gut can influence how immune cells can fight cancer in your skin. It just shows you the connectedness between, as Connie's pointed out in her talk, the immune system is a collection of cells and tissues that surveil the whole body. So as they're interacting with at surfaces um, in the gut, these cells can then travel to other parts of the body. And so it's really an interconnected system. And, uh, and again, we're just figuring this stuff out now. So kind of along those lines, uh, Connie or Rusty, um, Dr. Brundin and others in the neurodegenerative uh, disease department with uh, Parkinson's and such at Banana Institute talk a lot about um, Parkinson's might begin in the gut or um, inflammation. And we know inflammation might have a role or inflammatory markers might have a role. 
uh, as it plays in depression or uh, suicidality. Um, how do we understand that in the metabolism and nutrition space and what we can do to either um, modify or mitigate or address some of those issues? Well, maybe I can first speak to sort of general generalities about that and then Rusty can follow with metabolism. So I don't think there's a disease state that doesn't involve inflammation. And so um, it's, it's really integral to our health and our experience of disease. And there's this idea that um, out there that depression and inflammation, there could be a causative effect, of course, um, but that it the depressive symptoms resemble sickness symptoms, right? Um, there's some overlap with fatigue, tired, loss of interest, um, promotion of the body in the case of illness to rest and take care of itself and recover. And then these, in, in the case of de depression, these this inflammation sort of persists without the threat of illness and therefore without the ability to recover from illness. And so it, it's thought that they, the sickness behavior and depression might actually have similar biological origin. And so in, in, in terms of Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, I think inflammation has long been associated and uh, uh, potential, uh, potentially implicated in, in Parkinson's disease pathogenesis. But like most diseases, the more inflammation you have, you often have more um, severe disease or more problems with the disease because it's a it's a it's a part of your system that gets revved up. It utilizes resources, as Rusty said. It, 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 they need them, but they use them right. They utilize them and don't leave the resources for other cells. And if you have a bunch of immune cells roaming around a tissue, it really disrupts their function and their homeostasis, and then can contribute to the function of. of of almost every organ. Rusty, things to add as well from your perspective? The only thing I'll add is that, Connie summarized it really, really well. I think that the only thing I would add is that a lot of the inflammatory mediators that we think about, so these are the molecules that can cause inflammation, they have a root in metabolism. And what I mean by that is um, you could think about um, for example, proteins, the cytokines that are released by immune cells that cause inflammation, these pro the, the process by which these, pro these proteins are made is regulated by cellular metabolism. You need energy to make them, you need the raw materials to make them. So again, immune cells will use metabolism in order to construct these molecules that mediate inflammation. So you can target um, metabolism to affect them. Second thing is the my mitochondria itself can make some of these factors. Think of uh, reactive oxygen species and nitric oxide. These are inflammatory signals that are actually made from the mitochondria. So again, it all comes down to um, these energy regulating uh, factories in our cells that can actually have this, this impact. And so I'd like to you know, think about how the mitochondria function in inflammation can have an impact on the outside inflammation, regardless of what condition it is. Uh, fascinating. So the feeling I get or sense that I get is that um, the thought process is that metabolism and nutrition can off, off, and immunology can often sit in the center of disease modification. So um, when we start to look at um, even autoimmune responses, like you've mentioned regarding rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Crohn's disease, and others, is there ultimately a thought that diet could play a role in uh, controlling or uh, healing somebody from an autoimmune disease? Well, I'll jump in real quick is that, you know, the last example that we had was really an example of that, that simply modifying, you know, uh, the, the amino acid content of a diet can impact one type of autoimmune disease, so in that case, multiple sclerosis. And so it, I think it's just understanding what the needs of the immune cells are um, it can really help us design interventions. I think the one thing that Connie had brought on before is that you know, we can control inflammation with very blunt tools, steroids, for example, which are great at basically wiping out most of your immune cells, but you do need immune cells to help resolve 
infection and inflammation by itself. So essentially what we're ta talking about is can we use metabolism or dietary intervention to act as almost like a surgical knife to go in and specifically target um, cells that are causing the problem rather than just using a very blunt tool to wipe them out. And that's really where a lot of the research is focused on right now is, is how can we use diet or other metabolic interventions to restore the condition or cure, cure or treat the condition without all of the large side effects. I agree. And, and I'll just add that um, I think this is going to be very individual specific. And so we really need this thing called precision medicine, right? Where we really want to um, go after what the individual needs because what your body has in terms of energy um, sources or triggers is based on your individual genetics, diet and environment. And so what might work for one person may not work for another just simply due to exposure or past experience or, um, or something in, in, in their environment. I have heard anecdotally from just people I know that diet elimination can relieve sort of pains related to inflammation or chronic inflammation. Um, you know, when people try to go vegan or vegetarian or maybe limit gluten or other things. And so I think personally, um, if, if you suffer from something like that and, and your medicine doesn't work, I would, I personally would try it and, and try to you know, eat the things that make your body feel good, because ultimately, feeling good is is the measure of success, right? And so, and that's going to be individual uh, for every person based on on what their body needs. Yeah. Um, one last question. You know, we talk a lot about um, responding to diseases once we once things like cancer or autoimmune diseases have been diagnosed. Uh, thoughts on nutrients or diet that could be improved so that we can ward diseases off from the very beginning? I can jump in there real quick. I think that um, uh, a lot of, of, of dietary effects on, on the immune system can really be, it's not just the content that you take in, but when you eat it. And so I think a lot of uh, work, uh, fascinating work is, has been done and needs to be done on sort of fasting type regimens, which can actually so to help to coordinate your whole body metabolism, which ultimately can help your immune function. And so I don't want to use a generality and say everyone should go fast once a month. I'm just more saying is that I think that there is, um, there is some real science behind um, uh, nutritional input and the programming on our immune cells. And it's kind of funny because to me, we look back at, you know, several cultures and religions have fasting built in as, you know, uh, a part of the of the culture and there have to be historic reasons for this um, and I think that you know part of this if we look at it is health uh, immune function and, and whatnot and so this is where I think would be one really interesting area to, to consider and I'll just add one thing is that your immune system likes to quiesce overnight um, it takes it also takes the opportunity to sort of reset and rest and, and things like the vitamin D that you build up over the day and, and possibly melatonin assist with that. And so it's, it's similar to the fasting, but the, if, if you don't eat late at night when your body's trying to get ready for the, the fast period or the resting period, that will also help your immune system sort of quiet down and, and rest because there's nothing from the outside coming into the body. I am just thrilled that we have you and your team here at uh, Van Andel Institute. Um, I know for me personally, it's overwhelming to look at um, supplements and fasting and uh, all of that sort of thing. There are still unfortunately questions that we didn't get to today and uh, our sincere apologies, but we've hit our limit and need to wrap up. Um, Connie and Rusty, thank you for joining uh, not only Van Andel Institute, but also for joining us today for the public lecture on fueling the immune system. I know I walk away with added information and helpful information. So we uh, just give you thank and we thanks and we give you a virtual round of applause, uh, but uh, really appreciate your insights into the ways that we can 
uh, use metabolism nutrition so that we can both ward off disease and fight disease and have a better understanding of how diet influences uh, our holistic health. So uh, I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for taking the time out of your schedules to join us for today and sharing uh, with us your own personal passion for science, research, and the power of knowledge and discovery. Uh, these event events at VAI's research and educational programs certainly would not be possible without a passionate community of supporters, uh, sponsors, and advocates, uh, including all of you gathered here, and obviously uh, our founders, the Van Andel family, who helped establish the Institute right here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Our next public lecture will be held on September 30, and we will examine the latest neurodegenerative De neurodegenerative disease research here at BAI. Uh, but to find out more about all of our upcoming events and to stay active and engaged with the great work happening at the Institute, please head to our website at VAI.org. You can sign up for our mailing list there. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram for ways to continue to stay engaged. And all of these are great opportunities for learning about our latest research and education initiatives uh, and our many science-centered events like this virtual public lecture series today. Uh, we certainly look forward to having you back into our facilities, but right now, whether virtually or in person, uh, we hope to certainly see you again soon and enjoy the rest of your day.